still my favorite Motley Crue record, and I mean that with all respect to the records that came after it, but that first one, Too Fast for Love, still very special to me. I even have it on its original label, Leather Records. I have that somewhere in my collection, and that, of course, is PC Your Action from the first Motley album, and it's a great honor to welcome into the studio, sitting right across the console from me, the man who has played guitar on every single Motley Crue song and record you ever heard. There's not a lot of people that can say that about any band they're in. Uh, Mick Mars. Good to see you, man. Oh, thank you, Eddie. I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so glad we could make this happen. We uh, we got to talk briefly in Oklahoma last summer, I think it was, or last fall. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. guys were doing uh, a run of shows as a warm-up for the Vegas residency. That's right. We did three in a row there. Yeah, yeah. and I got a chance to uh, to talk with you and all the guys in the band over those three dates, and then... I think that last night I saw you getting ready to take the stage. You came up. You said, oh, we, should do, we should do your show sometime. I said, come on, Mick, let's do it. Yeah, I remember that. You said, uh, all you got to do is ask. All you got to yeah. do is ask. And then I called uh, my old friend Steve over here at your management. And now uh -huh. you're doing not only this show, but we're honored to be having you, of course, uh, on that metal show for the full hour tomorrow, which will tape and everyone will see this coming Saturday. Yeah, so that'll be fun. It should be fun. And, um, you know, as I was telling you off the air, one of the things being a lifelong radio guy that... I love so much about radio is the chance to take some time and talk and get into the history right. and the stories and incorporate the audience and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot going on with Motley Crue coming off of the press conference announcing this farewell tour that's coming up. And I was talking to Nikki a couple days ago. He mm -hmm. called me about something we were talking, and he said, you've sold like a million tickets or some crazy number already? I don't know if a million, but... Yeah, I, I'm not sure of how many, but there's like way over half the shows have sold out already. That's phenomenal, and I know that just recently a show here in New York at Madison Square Garden was announced. Yep, just before I got here. And I mean, that's, uh, for you, being a guy, not a New Yorker, is there still a huge prestige level to play in the garden? Is it still special? Um, yes. Actually, yes. The history of the venue and all? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because they, I mean, they say the garden is a place that bands play and they don't ever make any money. They just do it to say they played the well, garden. The, the garden. The garden is like, you know, the, the history is very long. I mean, think, think of like way back when, you know, Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling was boxing there. And you think of all that stuff and you think of Jimi Hendrix was there. All this stuff going on and you just go like, well, this has got some history going on. And it's, you know, cool just to sit there and go like, oh my... You know, so that was one you got to you had to have on the list for the final tour. I would think to make sure you did that, right? Of, of course, <laughs> of course. How do you feel about the band ending as a touring entity? Are you, you know, Vince was actually on this show last week. He called in to promote a charity thing he did in Vegas. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned to him. I mean, how do you feel about this plan to end the band? Um, I pretty much think uh, that this band is. Uh, Mm, I don't know, kind of like, uh, I don't want to say rent us course by any means, but we'd like to more more or less, right now we're at the top of our game, and it's the best time to kind of like get on out of it, you know, and do 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 more. I mean, like, Tommy has like projects that he wants to do, Nikki does, I do, Vince does, you know, and everything else, and Supposed to going out and going like, oh, you know, down on the bottom or whatever the heck, um, you know, uh, 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 what what would it, what would be the right? Word? A little pride in like more going out on top than than playing twelve people, um, you know, seaters. I'll do that when I'm on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the term that's commonly used for that is staying too long at the party. You've heard that term, term right? Yes. And that's mm -hmm. what you don't want to do. And well, yeah. I was just going to say we're calling this hair nation, right? Well, I call it trunk nation when I'm on because I'm not well, down with the whole hair thing. But well, well, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. All the bands that are around nowadays have no hair. So <laughs> much, no hair nation. You know? I remember people used to call the Scorpions a hair band. I'm like, no, they're more a hairless band. Yeah, we used to call them <laughs> men without hats. <laughs> But it's a great point. I mean, there are a lot of bands that, honestly, I think have, have stayed too long at the party, and you wonder kind yeah. of like, why are they still doing this? And Motley is an interesting situation because it's incredibly rare. You guys still have, beyond all odds, <laughs> the same four guys that started it. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, you can count on maybe one hand how many bands are out there today that still have the founding members in the lineup. 
How do you explain that? Because, I mean, there was this brief period of time in the band's history. You didn't have uh, Tommy. Yeah. You didn't have Vince yeah. for a record. But for the most part, you've been intact. I mean, you have to even be amazed at that over well, all these years. Yeah, I think there's only because there's four of us. I'm not sure. Um, well, it's easy no. for ZZ Top because there's only three. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> even that's even better. Right. But four, but, a lot of people can't keep four together. That's true. That's true. Do you, um, do you were there any periods in the history of the band that you felt you were going to leave? There was a few times, yeah. There was a few times on uh, we're doing Generation Swine album. That was a, a complete turnaround from uh, what I felt Motley Crue should be doing at the time. It was like we're not like you know House of Pain or. You know, those guys like, you know, Nine Inch Nails or anything like that. We're like a, a full-on just like hard rock kicking ass band. Right. You know, and not a, not a, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the hell was going on, but I didn't like it. It was, it was a very, very uh, difficult situation for me. Would I you mean, say that was your least favorite Motley record, Generation Swine? No, I can actually say I hated that album. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a song on that album I actually like a lot, though. Let Us Pray. No, Afraid. Really? Yeah, I love Afraid. Yeah. I actually really I think do. that was the only one that did anything off that record. That was the single, yeah. 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 So um, that was a period where you almost checked out and said, I'm kind of done with this? Oh, my. The producer that we had was going like... No, that isn't right. No, that isn't right. I don't hear that. Blah, blah, blah. I go, well, what, what is it that you're hearing? If you're the producer, tell me at least a little bit of an idea of what you want to hear. I don't know. <laughs> well, how am I, I don't have your brain. I don't know. You know, it's like some some weird thing, and I come up with like this little stupid little lick. You know, and it was like, that's perfect. I got only two notes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I had, I had a really hard time dealing with that record. How close did it get for you to leave? Did you have a conversation with the band and say, no. oh, I'm out of here? Or you just internally were thinking, I'm not feeling this? I was more internally. Yeah. You know, one of those uh, passive aggressive kind of things. Yeah. You know, I was like, sitting back and going, like, Arr! you know, and I was happy when they didn't call in for me to come in. To, to play <laughs> are you are you the kind of guy that keeps a lot of his feelings and emotions inside because you're the other three guys in motley crew are very much out there and accessible and you hear a lot from them and you hear of all their exploits and what have you and whether it be books or reality shows or what have you you are very much by motley crew standards an under the radar guy very the quiet guy very much to themselves you don't hear much or see mick mars in the gossip columns or what have you is that by design do you feel you, you just don't want to be out there like that um i don't I don't necessarily feel like I have to be out in the uh, public eye in that way. Um, I will, because I am, you know, going to do some stuff. But We'll talk about um, that, because I want to find out what yeah. you're about to do. But well, We could talk we'll, about it We'll tomorrow. get to that in a second. No, no, we want to we'll get as much <laughs> in as we can tonight. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I always said, I've always said, skip the shit. Music counts. I mean, all that, all that other stuff. You start believing your own hype. You start believing this. You start doing that. Forget it. You're over. Mm -hmm. You're done. You start believing that shit. Nah, nope. That doesn't make it for me. That's why I've always thought, and I've always thought that, um, um, all the time when I was like, you know, like a little guy or something, and and uh, somebody would be like too good to talk to me. And I always thought that was like a crappy thing, you know. How so? And, you mean with your own band members or just people no, you're no, on tour no, with? No, 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 Just people in, in general that would just like, you know, look down their nose at you, you know, the high society kind of a thing and stuff. And I was going like, you dumbass, <laughs> you know. You know, it, it, it really like, I don't want to say angered me, but it kind of like made me feel like this, this is... You, what makes you better than me you know so that's why i'm kind of like the guy that goes like you know skip skip the shit man i would i just want to play my guitar if you know me by my guitar playing you like my guitar playing that's all good that's great i'm loving it but if you don't it's cool too you know but i'm not gonna 
be judgmental at some people just because, like I said, they believe in their own hype. You know. So for you, the the whole experience of being in a major rock band is not about all the trappings that come with it, and it's it's about that hour and a half on stage or that moment in the studio and the creation it's just about you and your guitar that's your sole focus that's that, all you really care about right that's that's about it <laughs> i mean i love creating it i love creating my music and to see the satisfaction on you know the fans even the haters like seeing their faces it's just like <laughs> i love it i love it you know it's like i i get like i've said this before i get to see the whole world and get paid for it. What's a better job than that? Well, for sure. A lot of people would trade for that any day. Oh, yeah. Are you? Do you feel that your voice has been heard and that you've made the mark with Motley that you've wanted to make? Because in a lot of ways, I think you're a tremendously underrated guitar player. There's very, very few bands that I like as a single guitar band. Mm -hmm. Usually I like a second rhythm player or something just to fill out the sound. I, I generally liked, but there's very few that I've ever felt sounded truly full mm -hmm. and, and great live with a single guitar, as Motley does, which is a credit to you. Um, Thank you. Do, do you. do you feel that you've... I'm trying to find out the word that I'm looking for. It made the mark you've wanted to as a guitar player with Motley Crue. Or do you feel the same way that maybe there's you're not in that conversation that you should be with a lot of people? Um, I can answer that pretty quickly. There's there so, a lot of my heroes were the single guitar players: Alvin Lee, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page. Those people they have a very their own unique sound, and when I mean, when they started playing their solos, it was so full. You, you didn't need another guitar player. And that's the kind of band that I've always wanted. And um, I learned from him. Here's one, Leslie West. He was just on yeah, I know. that metal I, show last I, week. I, yeah. I watched that one. You know, it's funny. We had Leslie on. There are a lot of people that got it and understood why he was on a show like that. But there was younger people that had no clue. And they were yeah. like, who is this guy? All he ever knows is Mississippi Queen. I'm like, oh you God. don't know the impact this guy's playing oh, yeah. has had on so many people from Randy Rhodes to Zach Wilde to Satriani, oh, yeah. Yeah. on and on, and, and you as well, obviously. Yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, um, the way that uh, Leslie came out, when I first heard him on Mountain, um, his tone was like incredibly just like I was listening to on vinyl. And I'm going like, that tone is like nuts. And the way that he played Nantucket Slay Ride and all those kind of things, and I'm going like, whoa, this is really <laughs> this is really cool. But it also had like real emotional notes. When he'd play, you know, you could tell that he was really feeling it. It wasn't just a barrage of notes. It just went, watch how fast I can play. You know, I called that guitar diarrhea. He had he had some flair. I mean, he has some flair, and um, I don't know. I I I've liked Leslie for good lord, way way back, way back. We should have had him on the show this week with you. <laughs> I know, huh? He, you know what? He gave me the guitar. He gave I, uh, I in 1988. Um, he and I talked on the phone about doing Mississippi Queen again. Yeah, I don't know if he remembers, but. We did, and he sent home to me an eleven knob. Oh, really? Just, yeah, just the knob, and it's on my uh, on my black Paul that I used to start Molly Crew with uh -huh. in um, Florida. He he's a. Uh, it was interesting, man, because he gave me that guitar, and I did not see that coming. And uh, I can't play. I'm a huge fan of guitar players, but I can't play a note of anything. Uh -huh. So I've got all these amazing guitars that I've been so fortunate to be given by some legendary artists over my years. And they all just, I look at them and I think yeah. how cool it must be to be able to play it. And everybody says, well, it's never too late to start. But I just, I just don't have the discipline or the time to... And I just want to be able to knock out like a power chord, man. I'm under no yeah. illusions. You know, I just want to be able to play a riff. I want to be able to play... Uh, smoke on the water in Mississippi I was Queen. just thinking you were going to say that. I'll teach it to you. Yeah, but I just, I don't have, I have no time. I'll teach it to you. Um, 
Tomorrow in the dressing room, I'll, you give me I'll a teach you. I'll give you. I'll give you a guitar lesson. All right. It'll take two seconds, and you'll go like, that's how easy it is? I go, yep. Can you show me how to play the beginning of Kickstart My Heart? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's yeah. Can that's I ask crazy. you something? I always wanted to ask you about this, and I know we're jumping around here, but um, was that inspired by Montrose? Bad Motor I, Scooter? I, I told Ronnie that I was going to use that, and he was all happy. <laughs> He was all smiling and stuff, and and uh, he actually came into. Uh, we were rehearsing at the same place, you know, oh, of course not in the same room, of course. But yeah. but I said, hey, come over and check this out, and it's when I started first using a sub bass, and he started flipping out. He says, "Well, I haven't heard anything like this." And, he, and he's he's only this tall, or he was only this right. tall, and uh, yeah, but yeah. So it's a little so, homage so, to Montrose. I, I, I just like went back just for a second, just like when I was telling him, I'm, 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 I, I ripped you off, dude. <laughs> Bad motor scooter. Well, you yeah. you picked a good one for you know to start that song. But I tell you, to this day, when I hear the beginning of that song, it always takes me a half a second to find out if it's if it's uh, Ronnie or me, Ronnie yeah. or you. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and and it's because it's pretty much right in that sort of sound. I'm mm -hmm. um, talking live with Mick Morris and Teddy Trunk here on uh, Trunk Nation. Mick is live in the studio with me, and we'll hang out till we uh, wrap the show up at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 Pacific. I'm sure a lot of you guys are dying to talk to Mick. We will let you in on the conversation as well. Uh, the number is up on your radio right now. Mick will also be taping that metal show with us tomorrow here in New York. You'll see that episode premiere this Saturday at 11, 10 Central on VH1 Classic. Mick, where, just for people that don't know all the backstory with you, because you're, again, you haven't written a book. I don't know if you have one in you one day. Are you planning? Is that something you want to do one day? Uh, yeah, of course. Are you, are you working on it or you haven't started yet? Um, I've got a hundred billion thousand ideas of how I want to approach this. Um, I'm working on getting the parts together, but in which order, I don't know. From life to death or from death to life. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know if I'm going to go you... backwards if I'm lying in my hospital bed with 100,000 needles in me and and all those, whatever those stupid bags are <laughs> they put on you, and tell my story from then or from when I can have some kind of memory... Because I don't know if I'm going to... Did you keep a journal or anything over the decades? Everything's in here. You have a good memory? Yeah. Oh, oh you yeah. do? Oh, yeah. I can remember back to when I was one year old. Take me back, if you will. Let's go back. Where did you grow up? Huntington, Indiana. And when did you first move to Los Angeles? Uh, I was like eight years old. Your family moved there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like some for a job, or was it just... The weather? Um, yeah, well, par partially the weather for uh, um, my sister um, and, you know, doctors in the, uh, I'm going to really date myself. Doctors in the 50s didn't know, like, what they do today. Um, was your sister ill? Yeah, my sister was born with collapsed lungs, so they say, like, she needs to be in more in an arid kind of a place. And so... Um, what is there, Arizona, California? Nevada. Yeah. And uh, my aunt and uncle lived in California, so they go, okay. <laughs> and they came back and got us. And went out to California, and I was just like, whoa. And it was... When did you first pick up a guitar? When I was seven. And who was the... Was there one person you saw on TV or radio? Was it that one moment where it's like, I got to do that? There was... Um, I was three, three years old at the 4-H Fair in uh, Hires Park. This is still in Indiana? Indiana. Uh-huh. And Skeeter Bond was up there playing. I don't know if you know who he Do is. Do not. He's an old country western guy. And um, way, way back then, he, he stepped on stage, and it was mostly like picnic table looking things, you know. wasn't anything elaborate in you know, 4-H Fair. And... Uh, he got up there and he was playing and and um, he had on this bright orange suit with the little sequins all over and stuff, you know, uh, like the old country western, uh -huh. the real country western stuff right. was going on, and a big giant white Stetson hat, cowboy hat. I went, my jaw dropped. I go, that's what I'm going to do right there, as it was so he was he stood out so much. And from that, and hearing just that music and hearing it live, and this, I, 
I'm going to do that. That's what I want to do. And how long after did you get your first guitar? Four years. And did your... It wasn't a real guitar. It was like a nylon plastic it thing? Was, or? It, was a, it was a mouse guitar. <laughs> A what? One of those uh, Mickey Mouse guitars oh, that wind up. Oh, like really? It. Yeah, but I. <laughs> it played I, itself. Yeah, but I <laughs> semi learned how to tune it a little bit. Uh, Not really knowing it, but knowing like your strings are going to be in such orders to where you can play. Like, even though it was tuned wrong, you know, it's like you got some tightness on this string instead of like flapping around. Right. So you could actually use it to get a note out of. You know, you don't uh, you don't realize. I was watching last night. I'm clicking around on TV on Smithsonian Channel of all things. There was a documentary on the history of the electric guitar, mm-hmm. and you don't realize that if you really think about it. In a lot of terms, there it, the history isn't really that long. It's it's less than a hundred years by mm-hmm. far that the first proper. Uh, they were showing the earliest versions of electric guitars and what Fender yeah. did and what Gibson did. And yeah, the log. And the log, which was Les Paul's first thing, yeah. which I never knew. I thought that Les Paul's guitar was the Les Paul. In other words, the the shape of the Les yeah, Paul. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what developed from it. Right, but he yeah. made this log, and then he was the best-known player at the time, so they just named that guitar after yeah. him, which I didn't know. And then along comes Charlie Christian. Yeah, this was all in this documentary. It was yeah. it was cool stuff. What was yeah. your first guitar after the Mickey Mouse guitar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! I had a uh, a Stella. Kind of Robert Johnson would play a Stella. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And twelve bucks at a secondhand store. You still have it? No. Yeah. No. Nope. And then, so you're in L.A. When did you get your first rock band? When did you decide to go down that road? Hmm, I was like maybe 13 or 14 when I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And I'm like, hmm, you can do that? <laughs> and did any of the bands prior... That, I mean, I liked, I liked, uh, I liked like Dick Dale and, right. and the Venturers and all right. that stuff. And, and then uh, um, I saw the Beatles and I went, oh, there's even more, you know? So it's like, yeah, and I started like, you know, going to see it Hard Day's Night and, and watching like hands, you know, and playing and stuff. And I, and I actually learned like a couple chords here and there, you know, and playing by ear, you know, I learned how to play, you know, a lot of George's, um, you know, single notes, that kind of, his solos or whatever you want to call them. And... Were you know, that's that kind of junk. Were you in Were you in a band uh, prior to Motley Crue in L.A. that had made some noise? I mean, were there bands before Motley Crue that you were? Were they cover bands, or what did you? What were you doing before Motley Crue? Um, mo- mostly cover bands. It was uh, you know, I'd stick with them a couple weeks and go on to somebody else, or stick with these guys a couple weeks. Band called White Horse, another band called Vendetta, which was a, another derivative of White Horse, and. Uh, Oh, good Lord. I'd always... I was mostly a bum. <laughs> what what you were you what? playing in those cover bands? Who were you covering? Was it hard rock or was it more Beatles it, sort of stuff? What was it? Um, more um, hard rock kind of stuff. Uh, um, Deep Purple and... Um, it, it, well, it's hard... Wh- whatever we could get away with. Even bands that weren't known... There's a, a band that we covered a couple songs on called Wishbone Ash. Sure, I remember. Yeah, and uh, Rare Bird. Don't know them. Yeah, and we did some stuff like that. Now, uh, um, good Lord. Oh, this would take you away, not you, but me. <laughs> the Jades. Don't know them either. I know, that's because I was like a, a very young teenager. Very, I mean, like, it just turned, uh-huh. you know, and... Um, that was uh, more of a garage band, but we got a few gigs here and there, you know. So where? tell me about you getting into Motley Crue. Who meets who? Because I, I want to know that story, and I'm sure some of the audience does too, as we go kind of you know, through this history a little bit and get to some other things. But where did that, who met who first, and how did that all come down for you? I was, um, <laughs> I was playing in a... Um, well, we were called Spiders and Cowboys. <laughs> and so uh, 
We were playing at this little place, maybe mm, five or six hundred seat, kind of a little dive bar. And uh, I was paying like two bucks for a shot of tequila. I go like, fuck this. And I walked down at like a half a block to the liquor store and there was Nicky. He was working behind the thing. I think he was like 17 or something. And we were arguing about stuff. You can read this in the dirt. You know, it's like uh, arguing about, hey, who's your favorite band? Who's your this? That? He didn't like any of my bands. So I just in turn said like, well, I don't like any of your bands. <laughs> and so I go, you want to see a real guitar player? You know, like kind of like cocky. Yeah. You know, because he like was pissing me off. And he came down and he watched, he sat in the back in the corner and um he was watching me play and at that name at that time he was still frank and i was still bob mm -hmm. right so um he would uh he would he would he he couldn't believe it you know because i was like playing with mic stands and all sorts of stuff and goofing around very I, visual yeah I, I, nobody was there right. so i I'd go fuck it i'm playing everything right <laughs> you know and uh, um, yeah, so he was like he was he was knocked over by that, and um, so it was like mm, that's when uh, right somewhere between that and uh, some of those other bands that I had, Vendetta or White Horse or one of those, between that band and those bands, and me like being a bum running around on the street and then it was like five years and i put an ad in paper loud root aggressive guitarist available and nikki had called me but i didn't know it was nikki did he know he was calling you no wow that's crazy no, he, he asked me he asked me what i looked like and um i said well i have blue black hair halfway down my back i got marshall stack and i got a les paul and he goes okay that sounds good so i went <laughs> i packed all this stuff up in an opal right now was he nicky at this point or still frank no he was nicky at this point oh he was nicky so you definitely wouldn't have known he was because the guy you knew was frank right and his <laughs> hair was blue black my hair at that time was like a, a reddish color weird thing because i kept putting all sorts of weird crap in it and um I came in, knocked on the door, and he came up and he goes, aren't you that guy that came up to me at the liquor store? And I go, yeah, that's me. And he goes, and so we just went like, I hated you. And I said, I hated you too. <laughs> What's the big deal? I go, I'm here now, let's play. And uh, uh, Tommy had come over. So Tommy was in at this point? Yeah, Tom, Tommy and him had met through... Uh, uh, that, a friend that was both of theirs, a mutual friend. And um, so Tommy was there, and then they had uh, this other little guy. His name was Robin. And, he was a singer? Uh, he was a singer at the time? No, 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 no. He was a guitar player. Oh, oh. They had, so they it was going to be a two guitar thing. It was. <laughs> until I came in, I go, uh, you know, to Nikki and Tommy, I go, this guy ain't going to make it. <laughs> they went, fine, you tell him. And I did. I said, dude, you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> and and I was like a little arrogant, but not on purpose, but I didn't know what else to say. It's like, because I felt kind of bad because I, I knew him for like a day. <laughs> and he threw him out of the band <laughs> before had, you had the gig. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to go up to him and go, bye, you know? <laughs> and I was like... Did he um, ever go on to do anything? He got the shit kicked out of him in front of the rainbow a couple nights later <laughs> why I, I i have no idea he was he was a little bit um uh feminine i guess for a guy uh -huh. but he wasn't like you know um i don't think he was gay he might have been i don't know but uh not that that matters but he got they some people really beat him up pretty badly but beyond being beat up and thrown out of the band by you he never went on to anything like he's not in no nope. you know, he's not in white snake now or anything like no. that no <laughs> no all right <laughs> so so then then so vince is the last one in basically then right was vince there when you went for that initial jam no i had uh 
Uh, we had a guy named Odin. It's actually pronounced Odin, but he called himself Odin. And didn't like him. Was it the like, same like guy him. who, there was a band called that on the L.A. scene. Is it the same guy from that probably, band? Probably. Okay. He thought he was Roger Daltrey. I never saw the band. I just know the name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's the same band, but he uh, he came in and, and uh, he's kind of one of those peace, love, dope, kind of hippie kind of people. And I, I went like, um, if it, let, me, let me go back for a step for a minute. Um, we had went to the whiskey right after I told Robin to beat it. <laughs> and we went to the whiskey that night. And that's when I saw Vince. He was on stage with Rock Candy. Mm -hmm. Which was and, a cover band, right? Yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah. And uh, Again, I saw mon the, mon another Montrose reference, too. Yeah, exactly. Right. And he was uh, uh, dressed in all white leather. Little skinny kid, 19 years old. Women, girls, everything were just like going, ah, you know. And it's at the Starwood. You know how many people is that? 200, 300 people? But the girls were going crazy. And um, I'm like, that's the guy we need. Because sex sells. And <laughs> we went to rehearsal the next day, and there's Odin, Odin there. And I go, dude, I don't like this guy. And Tommy calls Nikki outside and goes, hey, Nikki, Mick don't dig. You know, Odin. I go, no, I want, to see, I want that guy that we saw last night at uh, Starwood. I go, I don't care if he sings. I don't care if he can't sing. I don't care if he can sing. I don't care anything. It's how he looks. You see the way the girls was going out for him? Yeah. That's what sells, my friend. <laughs> so let's get this straight. If it's not for Mick Mars, you have another guitar player, an effeminate guitar player named Robin in Motley Crue, mm -hmm. and you have a singer named Odin right now. And you may not be sitting here talking about a 35 year career or whatever in a farewell tour nope <laughs> it may never have gotten off the mat uh no it could it could have probably just laid there like about you know a hundred thousand other bands right. in, in la you know how's the material come together because you know vince has said this to me on my vince was on the tv show and he said it a number of times that he feels you know that that Nick, this is Nikki's thing. That Motley Crue is Nikki's thing, and that it's Nikki's band, and Nikki steers this ship, and all that. Was it like that even back then, or was it? Did it? Has it become that over the years that Nikki's kind of the dominant guy as far as running? And do you agree with that assessment? Um, I would say that uh, in the earlier days, um, Nikki was looking for a band. He wanted to call the band Christmas. I said, how about Motley Crue? And he go, uh, uh, you know, and he flipped out. And of course, he had to change the name of how I had it spelled a little bit. You know what I mean? So he was already kind of like being a little, what do you call it, dominant mm -hmm. th at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when we recorded our first record, um, we went looking for a few studios. And I knew a little bit about you know, outboard gear and gear and everything else because I'd record with some of these crummy bands that I'd played with and stuff. And so I said, oh, well, this has this and this has this, you know. And it was good and it had a Trident board. So I went, perfect. This would be a good place. It was like 60 bucks an hour. I think it took us 20 minutes to record the record. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but, um, yeah, we went there and... Uh, now, the material, though, was the material written already? Or did pretty, you, pretty did you guys write it together, or did Nikki come in there and was, say, this is how we're going to do it? No. There were some songs written, and he'd asked me to uh, um, help him rewrite a couple songs, which I did. But I didn't know that <laughs> at the time, that he'd already sold a couple of the songs to Rodney Bingham. Bingham. <laughs> Who is it? He was a... a he was yeah. Back, he was a way, DJ, right? Yeah, way back in the sixties. And and he was also he had a club in L.A. Yeah. that was like a hang place and all yeah. that. He yeah. sold the rights to Mo to the early Motley Crue songs to him. He he sold the the actual copyrights and everything to him. Why? Just for money at the time? Yeah, yeah. 
we were all broke, but you know, like, you know this is this is before I came into the band. Is Rodney still alive? I don't think so. So so does but does his estate still own the the publishing on the first record? You know, probably. Wow, probably. I did not know that. Yeah, because Nicky sold the the whole thing, and I think he just was just the first record though, not yeah, beyond that. Not 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 anything on uh, um, shout. Not no right. No, not anything on uh, uh, Too Fast for Love. Well, Too Fast for Love was the... Oh, so you're saying songs before... Before that. Stuff that wasn't on Too Fast for Love. Right. It was the single. Stick to Your Guns? Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> okay. So it wasn't... It was pre-Too Fast for Love, which explains why Stick to Your Guns probably wasn't on the, the You record. got it. You got it. <laughs> Oh, I got Cause it. Because okay. we re-recorded it for the and record. And Toast of the and Town was the other one. Toast of the Town, uh, we didn't do, and I still to this day don't know why. But that wasn't because somebody else owned the publishing? No. Okay. No. Stick to your guns. And another <laughs> another song that you did that was around that time that was a cover, which I it came out when the reissue of Too Fast came out, there's a bonus track on it. The band that got me into rock music as a little, little kid, uh -huh. the first band I ever heard that made the hair stand up because I heard distorted guitars. I'm talking really little backseat of my parents' car, AM radio. It was a band called The Raspberries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I heard this distorted guitars with the harmonies. That's when I first, that's when I broke out a little kid music and I was, I don't know, eight or nine. And that's uh -huh. when I discovered, and you guys covered a Raspberry song back yeah. then. Yeah. Tonight. Yep, that's right. Which is that's a bonus right. track on there too. Were you uh -huh. in on that or was that more of an, a, a Nikki thing? That was I, well, Nikki liked them. Yeah. Nikki liked the Raspberries. And um you know, I heard them but I didn't sit down and listen to them. I was listening to more people like for distorted guitars like Kinks. Right. Those kind of people like that, you know. Right. You know. But um um yeah, he showed me that song and I said, "Okay." You know, and then I learned it. And uh, we put it on there. Yeah, it's on the bonus, uh, the, the one of the bonus tracks if you have the reissue of, of Too Fast for Love. So as this thing progresses, I mean, it, it moved quick. I mean, I remember being in the business back then. I Like I said, I have the, the first record came out on a label called Leather Records, which was basically your own label, right? That's right. And yeah. I have that version. It's a different mix of the record, too. Um, which one is it? Glasses or no glasses? Oh, that I don't know. See? You mean... The first one of Too Fast for Love, I think, was only 1,000. Maybe a little bit more. Maybe 2,500. Around the, around there somewhere. And it didn't have the sunglasses in the center. Now we're all posing around the edge of the cover on the back. Mm -hmm. The first edition didn't have that. The second one did. Really? Yeah. Wow, now I have to dig mine out and find out. Yeah. That I did not know. Yep. <laughs> so, but it was still on leather records. The the one with oh, yeah. both mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then of course that record gets remixed and put out on Electra as your debut. Well, yes, yeah. As far as yeah, the guy level. the guy that recorded it recorded it pretty badly, <laughs> and uh, RTB came in. Roy Thomas Baker did all the Queen stuff and right. everything, and uh, he thought it was just horrible how it was recorded he had a tough time with it but um we had a good time though you know redoing it and stuff and going like that because Roy, roy's roy's the kind of a uh, producer that likes to play guitar in other words when he gets on the board everything's kind of mixed and stuff and he plays with the guitars i'm surprised you never worked with him again after that it sounds like it was a positive experience you never it, did right it was no it, yeah it was a positive and uh I'd go over to his house and hang out with with him, a, you know, a little bit sometimes, and uh, that's when I met Rick Nielsen, Cheap Trick, and all those guys. And uh, um, you know, I don't know. We, I I really liked Roy a lot, but I don't know why we never worked with him again. Yeah, Teddy Trunk talking live with Mick Mars of Motley Crue. We will get your calls in for Mick. I promise you. Before we wrap things up in a little bit, well, more than a little bit, we got over an hour left to go. Again, the Motley Crue farewell tour uh, is happening, and I'm looking through a ton of dates here. It looks like the first one starts July 2nd in Grand Rapids, and the last one I have listed is November in Spokane, Washington, mm. and uh, 
talking to Nikki on the phone the other day. He's got plans beyond that too, which I don't know what you know about, but he's going to, yeah, I think you're going to pretty much go into 2015, I'm thinking, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll get more into this tour and exactly what people are going to be seeing and hearing before, of course, we, we let you go. But before we get to that and, and the future and now and all that, just as we're in the in the history a little bit, were you always interested in doing a theatrical thing? Because when Shout at the Devil yeah. ca- comes around, mm-hmm. the band got heavier, mm-hmm. I think. I liked... My favorite album is still Too Fast for Love, regardless of how it's recorded. There's just something about those songs and something that that record captures. On the Too Fast for Love? Yeah, I love uh, it. It's yeah. a perfect I, balance between there's edge and attitude, but there's still a little bit of a a, a poppy element to certain mm-hmm. things. There's still a glammy element, but there's still attitude and heaviness yes. and rawness. Something That's about exact, that first record. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with you. And then Shout. And hunger. Yeah. And then Shout, I'll never forget getting it. I mean... I was working in a record store at the, at the time. The band gets much, I think, much more of a metal band uh, in terms mm. of how you looked and fire and brimstone and that gatefold sleeve on the record. There's a pentagram oh, yeah. on the cover and you guys are like in hell in the, in the gatefold. Well, the decision to get heavier at that point. Tell me about that. Um, mm, I got to think of the correct way to say this because I don't want to get my ass sued or anything, but um, Electra Records, when they signed us, um, there was Electra and Virgin. They came to us when we were playing at the um, Pasadena uh, or Gardena. One of those little places that uh, Van Halen played all the time. And we finally played there and it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. and Electra was there. And Virgin Records was there. Both courting you. Both courting us and mm-hmm. going like, um, you know, offers and this different, you know, monies and stuff. And I go, take Electra. They offered us less, less to pay back. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they made, uh, we, we actually pulled them out of the, the hole. They were ready to fold. Electra was? Yes. Wow. And we saved them. Um, and that was Joe... I can't remember his name. I want to say Joe Smith, but I don't think it's Joe Smith. Shortly before Bob Krasnar took over. And uh, um, we brought them out of the hole. So it was just like they were, you know, ecstatic about it. <laughs> but we still had to fight for the double, you know, code, and the, the fold-out thing, and, you know, the big fire, and this, that, and the other, and stuff like that, and the pentagram. You notice that... Uh, after that ran for a couple of years, they put us on the cover. Yeah. 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 I they, think they, on the CD and the cassette, you were on the cover yeah, instead. They, they didn't like the pentagram. They didn't understand. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the same thing as the pentagon without these points, you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was a powerful... I mean, that's when the band really... I mean, I remember seeing... The, the, that was the tour with Ozzy. Yes. And uh, I was at that show, and I remember seeing it at the, at the Metal Lance here in New Jersey. And I remember... I remember then uh, going forward to Theater of Pain, which was a record I didn't like, to be honest with you, outside of, is that a good, you're holding up a a peace sign? Does that mean? Yeah, that's my second worst one. Oh, all right. I thought you were going to no, say I'm out a, of my mind. Okay. There, no, there's only... See, great like, minds think alike, Mick. I like right. this. There's, a, there's only... There's we only, should have done this interview years ago. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> telling you what. <laughs> we're on the same page here. That's right. But it was, it was just... To me, I remember, I think you guys played a headline show Mm -hmm. at the Beacon Theater, maybe, in New York, for Theater of Pain, Mm -hmm. before it really blew up. Yeah. And I still have the invite for this, because you had a party, an after party, somewhere in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was there. At the... uh, It was like some loft or something. Now I'm dating myself, because I can't can't remember. I just remember... I can. uh, 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 Limelight. Was it the limelight? Yeah, it was the limelight. Yeah. But the show was... Bi- and then what happened... Well, I always love, like, Motley has this history of, like, all this... Like, very much like a chameleon. I mean, you look at the history of the band. So you mm-hmm. went from Shout, which was dark and heavy and pentagrams. Mm-hmm. Theater of Pain, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Mick's I, holding I, up jazz <laughs> hands for radio. It was, you know, <laughs> Nikki's in... Uh, Black and white striped Pete Way like tights and Vince is in a pink blouse or something. Yeah. 
it's a completely different thing. And, and I, I, you know, the look was one thing, but the record itself, outside of a couple moments, was I guess it was just the excess of everything happening so quick, right? There was, um, there was a a couple good songs on there. Um, Home Sweet Home. I was on there, right? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. that's what I thought. I was. Oh yeah, yeah. I was that was probably. Damn, the, the, am I losing my mind? That and smoking <laughs> in the boys' room were the and, this, well, the smoke, album savers. Well, see, the smoking in the boys' room is we did that one to break the mold to get on radio. How are we going to get on radio? Smoking in the boys' room was a hit. Play a hit, you'll be played. It'll be a hit. That's the way we was thinking. But that wasn't the first cover you guys did because you did Helter Skelter on Shout. Right. Which wasn't even, a, never it released was, even a single. It wasn't a heat. It wasn't a heat. It wasn't a hit. Right. Right? Well, yeah, Brownsville um, Station with yeah. Smoking in the Boys' Room is yeah. a bigger song. Yeah, sure. Yeah, way big. Um, and you um, had that big elaborate video for that, too. Oh, yeah. That's where I met Michael Berryman. One of my favorite people. <laughs> Who's that? Michael Berryman? Yeah, the, was he the actor or what? It, yeah, he's done all those Hills Have Eyes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's in. The, he's the teacher or something. Yeah, in that. yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember. Yeah. Okay, no, I never knew his name, but I know exactly yeah. the guy you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool guy. Yeah, but um, but musically, Theater of Pain, you would agree that it, it missed the mark. It, was, it it missed the mark because we we're like, all of us were really drinking too much. The only song that we really, really, really. Mm buckled down on and and played it just at rehearsal way too much was uh, Home Sweet Home. I'm going to those other songs, you know. But, uh, you know, Home Sweet Home and Home Sweet Home never became a hit. And uh, Don't Go Away Mad became a semi. No, Don't Go Away Mad, you're going forward now. Home Sweet Home was a big hit. No. You don't think never, so? Never went to number one. Maybe chart wise, but that video was on. Well, MTV yeah, it was on for 14, 14, 14 weeks in a row. Yeah. But I mean, that video. I mean, having a hit back then, radio was one thing, but there was nothing bigger than MTV, and you guys ruled MTV. Yeah, that's so, right. So uh, to this day, "Home Sweet Home" is an, an like, iconic Motley Crue song. Yeah. Even though chart wise, I don't know where it went in the top forty, but I think. 42. <laughs> so you missed the no, top 40 I, by two. I I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. Um, what, what happened with that is there was just a little bit of a blunder on that one. Is uh, Electra released that song just a bit too early. If they had released it right about the time when all that stuff was going on MTV, bam, it had been monster. But... They put it out there too quick. Wow, interesting. Mick Mars is my guest. Eddie Trunk here live for another hour and change and uh, just having a great conversation with Mick. He's shooting that metal show with us tomorrow. You'll see that episode premiere this Saturday night on VH1 Classic, and we will grab your calls in just a little bit. Oh, uh, Mick, I could go on forever with you chronologically here. We need many more hours to do that, and I want to let the audience get involved. But... Um, I want to jump forward real quick to an interesting record in the Motley Crue catalog and get your take on it. Mm -hmm. It's a record I get a lot of people that ask me about. It's a record that there's a lot of fans of, but I obviously, because of the timing it came out, it wasn't successful. But the Motley Crue, Motley Crue album, the one with John Karabi on it. Right. What was your thoughts about that record in that period of time of the band? Um, I thought that... Um I'll probably get kicked in the nuts for this, but um, I thought it was like a, a a really great album. It was a great step forward for us. Uh, different style of music. Uh, I thought it was much heavier and much more... Uh, um, I don't even know how to say it. It's like the songs sounded more like songs. There was like different parts. There was like a lot of stuff going on. Um, I did a I did a track on that. There was eighty two tracks. Eighty two guitar tracks. Eighty two guitar tracks. Wow. What song? And, um, good lord. I don't even remember it. I don't remember the name of it. But it was on there. Eighty two tracks. Bob Rock had told me 
there's 82 tracks. And I'm going, oh, okay, we need more. <laughs> Can't do that one live. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No, but it's like little parts, you know, there and right, there, and right. all this stuff. And um, um, we'd actually, uh, you know, digital audio recordings was just coming in and that, right? Mm -hmm. And we borrowed Brian Adams' dat, you know, with a lot of, uh, what is it, one-inch tape or half-inch tape or whatever it was they're recording on then. And uh, we used all that stuff, too, to, you know, to get all the stuff in. Anyway, long story short, yeah, there was a lot of stuff on there. I thought that that album was fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of people that love that record. And I think that, obviously, any band changing a lead singer is a tough, tough thing to do. There's, oh, yeah. there's only a handful that have ever pulled it off success mm -hmm. successfully. Van Halen. Yeah. ACDC. Yeah. It's very hard to do. It's even harder to do when the singer that's being replaced is still alive. Mm, you know, yeah. in ACDC's instance, obviously there was no choice. The band either goes on or ends. Right. But in in a case with, you know, Van Halen or your, or Motley Crue, you know, Vince was still alive. And it's interesting because you were the guy that fought and found Vince in the band. And, and yeah. at that point, though... Well, I, I don't think that uh, truly my, my real feelings on that is he didn't want to be in the band anymore. Right. He was kind of like tired of it or something. I, you know, I don't know. I didn't want to pick his brain on it. But I can say when Karabi came in, it made the band jump way beyond um, anybody's expectations back then. The crowds, the fans, everything else, and they were all like, now they get it. Now people see it and they go like, that Karabi album was like really great. Yeah. And I go, yeah, and, and sonically, and writing wise, and lyric wise, and everything else. I I thought it was. I I still think it is. But it's tough because no matter what you did, whether it was Vince or anybody in that spot, you're uh -huh. dealing with what was that album ninety four ish, I think. Yeah, there somewhere around there. Yeah. I mean, you know, as better as as well as anybody. No matter how big you were in the eighties, mm -hmm. a, a band that made their mark in their eight in the eighties in nineteen ninety four. No yeah. matter who you had singing, no that's matter right. who was in the band, unfortunately, wasn't going to get a fair shake. That's 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 true. I mean, it was that's just true. a brutal time for for all the bands that came from the seventies and the eighties, for that matter. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, you know, you wonder if that change would have happened at a different time if it would have been looked at it a little bit more objectively. You know, you don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, things need to change it up. You know, like. How about the Stones in the 70s? You know, it's like they couldn't sell out a phone booth. You know? Um, I, and, and the way that I think and I see things, that if any band stays together long enough, right? Meaning that their fans are young teenagers having fun and this, that, and the other, and having their babies and having their wives and having their kids and having all this stuff, they come back. You know, and... 10, 12, 15 years. How, depends on how old they are. And the crowd all of a sudden gets bigger again. If he's stuck together, it's all good. Then they're turning their kids onto it. And they're going, wow, this mm -hmm. is a great band. And blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's just my stupid trash can philosophy on, on stuff. But, you know, it's the way that I see things. No, the it bands, turns over. The generations yes. turn over. Yeah. You know, I mean, the bands from the 80s are now a new generation's classic rock. Isn't it weird? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a radio show... On, on FM radio, too. That's a syndicated show. It's on about 25 cities. It's on in New York. And it's amazing to me because even after all the things I've done, whether it be TV, radio, what have you, mm -hmm. it's a battle every week to get program directors to run this three-hour week show because yeah. they'll have me on as a guest and on their morning show, but they'll look at a playlist and they'll see a Motley Crue song like Hooligan's Holiday that I may have mm -hmm. played, right? Yeah. We don't know that. That's not, you know. They, uh, we can't run this show. What is uh, that? You know. Uh, and it's amazing that mentality because it's like there's a whole section of people in their 40s right now that I'm not saying Hooligans Holiday, but but their song the, the, Motley Crue and so many other bands are that generation's classic rock. Yeah. They didn't grow up with Layla. Right. They grew up with Live Wire. Yeah, Live Wire. And, <laughs> you know, it's you a, know. just a generational thing. Do you see a lot of kids at your shows now? Young kids, pa parents oh, yeah. bringing their kids? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and a lot of kids that are like, you know, 17, 18 years old just 
coming to and seeing Motley for the first time, going like, "Wow, I was blown away!" And you know, uh, it's it's like a, it's cool to me. I mean, I really like it to see like a whole. I mean, little tiny things all the way up to like you know teenagers, and then you know, I can't tell them how old they are anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because they, uh, I I don't know, but uh, it's it's a. a it, to me, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. It's just it's it's a really cool thing to experience and and see all that stuff. And um, I mean, seeing somebody that you know was like this kid going yeah 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 yeah. Like I remember Sebastian Bach in uh, Canada. Oh my gosh! Before- he was he was fourteen. <laughs> Dude! <laughs> 14 years old and he would kick he kicked out the glass before the doors opened he kicked out the glass we're doing sound check and he kicked the bottom of the glass off underneath uh, like the doors are here and the you know nobody can see me on radio but underneath the big glass is like a smaller glass and he kicked that in people were coming in during sound check and he was the first one there. Uh, you know stuff like that and it's like you know seeing stuff like that but then we, that's kind of what I'm saying now it's like you still see that energy coming from our older fans kids right it's weird yeah yeah definitely it's definitely amazing to see the generations turn over uh, we're talking again with uh, Mick Mars and Motley Crue um, Mick just and again going through the history here a couple more things and we're going to go to the phones but um what about what were your thoughts when Motley didn't have Tommy in the band? Because you had a period of time, Randy Castillo, the late Randy Castillo was in. Mm-hmm. It's Samantha Maloney playing in there for a little bit. Mm-hmm. It was a big deal. I was at the press conference and I did an interview with you. I don't know, know if you guys remember all four of you in 2006 at Mates, I think, for VH1 Classic back then. Uh-huh. Because it was the Red, White, and Crew thing just before the reunion and the press conference and all that. Yeah. So it was a big deal that everybody was back and in, intact, yeah. all four guys. Right. But was it rough not having Tommy there, being such a, a visual part of the band and such a great player um it's uh well the crowd shrunk (laughs) um yeah i you know it's like i mostly when i play i listen to the drummer the most more than anything (laughs) i mean beside myself um for for feel and stuff and tommy and i were extremely tight um Randy uh, was more the type of drummer like uh, Mitch Mitchell, something like that. There was like there was a beat there, but where was one? And sometimes it was a little hard to to follow him. And uh, Samantha was pretty solid, but um, you know, not. I think we got several phone calls on an interview once, going like, "You're the only person I in Motley Crue I'd asked to marry." <laughs> you know? and, and and weird things like that was weird and, and I missed Tommy you know yeah I missed him I wanted him back how do you how do you attribute the fact that this band is still all alive and together on this farewell tour you're about to go out I mean everybody knows the stories they're well documented of the excess and the mm. craziness and all that but here we are in the early stages of 2014 you're about to do a farewell tour and it's the same four guys that started it. I mean, that's remarkable when you really think about it, that you're all together. Yeah. You know, there's a lot made of the dysfunction internally in Motley Crue. Do you think that's exaggerated? Um, I think there's a lot of dysfunction in just about any kind of family-type situations. Yeah. You know, families, themselves, and and groups of people are, you know, you know, that if, if we didn't have... I mean, just think about it. If we didn't have uh, um, arguments and different ideas and stuff, where the hell would we be? Still in caves? I don't know. Shit. I mean, maybe I'm like explaining this wrong or, or going into a weird spot. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know, not physical fighting, but mentally kind of like going like, ah, oh, you're full of shit. No, man, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not. You know, you know, it's just the way that it is. You know, with anyone, anyone. Well, most bands. 
Yeah. Most bands actually well, like the, that. Well, the, the, okay. The bands that have been together for less than a year get along really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then see what happens after 12 months, right? That's, that's right. Of your last few tours, you, did, you recently did a tour, um, I guess a couple years ago now, where you went out with Kiss, and then prior to that... You did a tour with Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. of, your, of your more recent tours, what were some of the highlights? What, what did you like? What did you not like? What were the highlights for you about those tours? Anything stand out? Um, Aerosmith I got to go up and play on stage with. What'd that you was, go up and do? What'd you play? Um, on uh, When Joe Perry goes out and does Joe Perry Project, Yeah, uh, he does blues stuff, uh -huh. and he knows that I like the blues, so he had me set in, and... Uh, we jammed out one of his one of his songs, and uh, I think he, Joe, goes like was looking at me, and especially Brad was looking at me, going like, "What?" <laughs> you know, like. Uh, but that was that was they, kind of a meaning in a yeah. way that they didn't expect you to play like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Gene, God, this is going to be mean, but I have to say it. <laughs> say it. Um. I'm sitting there, and boy, I was actually walking down the hallway. Gene was coming the other way, getting ready to go on stage. We just come off, and um, um, he goes, "Man, I just got to tell you how great of a guitar player you are," and you know all this stuff. And I was just like, "Going, this is come from Gene Simmons." I'm going, "Okay, okay, okay," and I go, "Well." what about the rest of my band? Tommy's right here, like where this bottle of water is. And he goes, fuck them. Sounds like Gene. <laughs> when I, in front of my band, you're saying this, fuck them. Wow. You know, so that was, what, that was, what do you, that was what pretty, do you make of, you know, I have, uh, there's a lot going on with that band right now in the news. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm good friends with Ace and Peter, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up a huge, huge Kiss fan uh, uh -huh. my whole life. They were the first real band that made me into this whole world. And I, I've been honest in saying that I kind of checked out on seeing them because I don't like the fact, nothing against Tommy and Eric, they're good people and good mm -hmm. players, yeah. but I don't like the fact that they're not their own people. I still look at it and I see Ace and Peter yes. being impersonated. There's, there's, it's, there's, you're not the only person on the planet that would say that, and the same... As goes with Motley, and the same would go with like uh, the Beatles. The same if like Mick and Keith Richards broke up. I mean, you wouldn't, you know what I mean? Yeah, but the difference is when you had Karabi in the band, yeah. you didn't put a blonde wig on him no. and tell him to go act like Vince. <laughs> no, no, it was Karabi. Yeah, that's the difference to me. Yeah, but all that aside. And you're right, I know there's tons of people that feel the same way as I do, but mm -hmm. not everybody vocalizes it, and that's what I do for a living. But that's right. <laughs> the, the thing about it is, um, you know, one day Motley Crue will go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame mm -hmm. when they get their heads out of their asses over there and figure out the bands that should be going in. And you guys have been eligible now for, I think, uh, probably about five, six years. Because was... it's 25 years after the first record, so you've been eligible about six, seven years already. Well, I was there when they were building the building. In Cleveland? Yes. Why? This I don't know. Were you on the crew or something? <laughs> no. I wasn't was on it the, the crew. Was the lead times of Motley Crue? They, they, they invited <laughs> us out. I guess the the uh, supervisor or whoever it was that was building it or whatever the heck. And he goes, this is going to be uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we had to put on hard hats and walk around. Oh, and so and photo stuff. op. And, uh, you know what? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Now that you say that, something like that, yeah. But do you think, of, like, with what's going on with Kiss is crazy now because they don't want to play with Ace and Peter. They want to play with the current band, even though only the original four are going in, and now nobody's going to play, and it's this whole crazy thing going on in that world right now. Mm -hmm. They've been ignored for 15 years, and now they're finally getting in. Right. Do you think about that sort of stuff? Is that important to you to go into something like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Um, if, do you want my honest answer about this stuff? Of course. I can tell you this. Grammys? Uh, Oscars, um, any kind of award achievements that people get, um, to me, is kind of like when you're a child in kindergarten and you take your nap and you get your gold star. I don't give a shit about that stuff. I give a shit about me 
my music, how I write, and how much people love it. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters to me. Mm -hmm. I don't need an award for that. You know? Your, your writing and your music has been, for the most part, throughout your entire career, confined to Motley Crue. Mm -hmm. And that makes that kind of, you kind of unique in that way, because Nikki does 6 a.m., and he before that he had Brides of Destruction, and he's done yeah. stuff on the side. Tommy has done solo records and DJ stuff and reality shows, and he has stuff on the side. Mm -hmm. Vince goes out with his own band, does club dates or whatever dates with another band all the time. Yeah, You have pretty much been the only guy that's it's motley or nothing throughout this entire process. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that for you? Uh, you just don't feel like going outside of the nest, so to speak, or you, you're going to do that when the time is right? Um. Loyalty is kind of important to me. But, I mean, doing side projects and everything else, nothing wrong with it at all. Um, but <laughs> I I have my own stuff like that I've been stashing for so you've a been long like an, time. So you've been like a squirrel <laughs> building all these years? Oh, yeah. And you've been waiting, you're waiting for this I've, last tour date to come up on this long sheet and then Mick Mars unleashes? And then all <laughs> of a sudden, it's going to be something that I go like, I didn't know Mick could do that. So what what can you tell us now about that? You, you uh, a record, a solo record? Is that the idea? What um, what can you share with the audience when Motley's done that you want to do? I can honestly say that I am going to release at least an EP. As far as a whole album, right now, I won't release a whole album until I think every single one of my songs is an A song. And I've got a shitload of songs, and they're all B songs, C songs. You know, I'll, I'll give them to, like, baby bands coming up, um, um, TV commercials, movies, soundtracks, whatever the heck. But I will not put them on my record until I believe in my heart that they're A songs. So when you hear them, you have to have all of them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like that. That crap of where... No filler. You know, no fillers. If I hear a filler in there or anything I think is a filller, nope. But then who am I to judge? Somebody might like it. Have then, you then, then, re then you release singles. Right? Have you demoed stuff or is it fully recorded or where where does this material, what kind of state is it in? Um, I have um, about six songs. I mean, I have way, way more than that. But they're all like, to me, they don't matter. You know, they're laying there. I mean, stacks, backs and tapes and everything else. And, and I have a studio in my house, of course. And I uh, um, go down there almost every day. Um, and just in the past week or so, I've written six new songs, which I believe are pretty much on their way to being A songs, which is like I need... Uh, um, someone to come in to help me not like a range by any means i know what i'm hearing and i know what i want to hear it's like the guy that helped me because i'm not a singer you know i, gotta, I was going to ask you you have yeah. a scratch vocal on there or anything or I, are you just dude my voice sucks so bad <laughs> <laughs> well they put a microphone in front of you on stage with motley i don't know if it's on or not but there's one up there <laughs> um well you know that's another that's a whole nother story right there son <laughs> What story? Tell me that story. What is it? Uh, um, that story? I don't know. Um, that could get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I, I could say that there's like a. Let me put it this way. Um, I'll just say two words and two words, and you'll know. Britney Spears. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I kind of know what you're saying. <laughs> I've been to some shows recently. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Is that a? Is that a? It's somewhat of a controversial issue within the band? Um, no, but I think that it is between a lot of fans, a lot of new music people. Well, just what, what you're alluding to is supplementation on the live stage. Yes. To, to, in, a, in a way. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel about it? I don't like it. I think a band uh, like ours... Uh, like, I have to say, like, 60s bands were about my favorite, 60s and 70s bands, where they were real, like, uh, three-piece bands, 
you know, or four piece bands and just got up there and kicked it out. Made a mistake, so what? Sound a little bit empty here or there, so what? Mm. You know, it's the bigness and the rawness and the people that developed and that wrote the songs and made them and and you know, presented them, you know. Um to me, that's that's what I really like. Well, I, I love. I mean, I could, I could, I could put on uh, a Motley CD and play with it all day long. You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. No, and I, I love. That's what I love about the live experience. The, the, the. It's the sound. It's live. The mistakes. The dropout. Whatever it is. That's I mean, right. And, and that's one of the things that bums me out about so many concert DVDs that I see. That mm -hmm. it's clear to anybody with half a brain. You can watch one and say, well, oh, the entire lead vocal is re-recorded. Mm -hmm. The entire this track was re-recorded. Yeah. And it, you basically are then just getting a studio record with an applause track behind yeah. it. Overdub. <laughs> yeah, and, and my thing is, like, my favorite things to watch are, like, bootlegs. Stuff that, because you're getting it real. Thank you. You're getting <laughs> that live feeling. And That's I right. think that is so important. And, you know, there's a lot of bands, though, you guys are far from the only band doing that, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I feel the same way you do. I like warts and all, as they say, in a mm -hmm. live performance. Yeah. But um, there are others, and I've talked to sound engineers and people like that, and they say, well, you know, there's a lot of people paying 100 bucks for a ticket, and they don't give a shit. They want it to sound like the record. Mm -hmm. I, don't get that te I don't get that thought, maybe because I'm an older guy. To me, that's not me at all. But there are... There's those are the arguments to it, hmm. and you guys, Motley, for a time, you had female backing singers. Yes. So you did, cre you did recreate it because yes. you've got huge backing vocals. I mean, yeah. you, you'd need a hundred singers up there to make That's it sound right. like that. That's right. But you did have what they, you call them the nasty habits, I think. Yeah. You had girls up there on stage. Yeah. Yeah, and after that was some other. Um, it was uh, Meatloaf, Meatloaf's daughter, Pearl, Pearl a day. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, she was up there for a while and. You know, a couple other, a couple other people. You know that. I think Pearl's the only one that did anything from it, the whole thing. There's, there's people that handle. There's bands that handle that in different ways. They, they just go, like Cheap Trick. Here's the four guys that did it. It is what it is. Robin's a great singer. It's going to sound like it sounds, and it's raw. It's real. It's what it is. Yeah. Then you've got bands that put some stuff on tracks. Then you've got bands that have a guy like Aerosmith, mm -hmm. but they don't hide him. Russ Irwin is his name, and yes. he's up there on the, the back of the thing. Stephen will reference him, and they'll mm -hmm. put a light on him, and this guy's helping us out. You know, Sabbath has a guy, but he's off stage. You don't see uh -huh. him. Yeah. Everybody, you know, for years, Kiss had a guy off stage, a couple different guys. So everybody kind of has a different mentality see, about it. That, I, I like, um, here's the light. Here's the guy that's helping us right here. He's playing keyboards. He's firing this. He's firing that, or he's doing this that, and the other this is our guy he's helping us yes i that i would agree i would agree with yeah that's fine to me yeah. i mean there's nothing wrong with there's that. nothing behind the curtain no 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 not no wizard of Oz's. <laughs> <laughs> mick mars is here being very truthful and open about so many great things this has been amazing and we just went through geez an hour and 20 minutes just me and you and i could go for hours more um i promised the audience a chance to talk to you and we're going to do that i'll make good on my promise the lines are all jammed we have a little over 40 minutes left or a little under 40 before we have to end the show i'm going to play one song so we can get a little water regroup reset and then before i keep going at you if you want a few calls from the audience they'd love to talk to you i'm sure I, i'm i'm open all I'm right ready. awesome mick mars hanging out here Trunk Nation, Eddie Trunk Live on Sirius XM uh, for another 40 minutes. We're going to go to the phones. They're all jammed, but as we answer calls, we will uh, open up some lines for you to get on. Let's play a Motley song, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll let you finish up by talking to Mick Mars. Again, you'll see him on that metal show this coming Saturday. We're taping it tomorrow here in New York City. I'm going to play something from the last Motley record from Saints of Los Angeles. I'm going to play the title track. Cool. And... This sets up one more question from me. The decision to not do a new record to coincide with this tour. Were you mm -hmm. on board with that or do you how did you see that? What's your take on it? Um my take on it right now and the way that things work are very much reverted back to the sixties, to where people will buy singles. They don't want to ban uh, a, a, an album full of fillers. You know, like what we were talking about earlier. Right. And and that's why I said I would re release an EP or singles. 
So you know might might that be something that would come from Motley at some point, or do you think Motley's done making new music? Uh, I just wrote a new song with Nikki, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be finishing it up like within the next couple months. So there yeah, could be like, a song or two that comes out during this run of dates. Oh, there, there'll be a new album, uh, not an album, a new a new single. Kind of like you did that song "Sex" for the last tour. That yeah, just exactly, came out, right? exactly. Yeah, got it. All right, let's do "Saints of Los Angeles" from Motley Crue, and then we'll come back about a half an hour left in the show. It'll be all yours to fire away at Mick Mars, who has been nice <laughs> enough to be jo so generous with his time and come into the studio. Uh, for a little warm up, you know, the hardest thing for me doing this stuff is tomorrow. Like I said, we're we're going to uh -huh. do TV together, and I'm going to have like three segments of five and a half minutes. Of course, with my partners out there as well. So you know, it's so good to be able to get all this stuff in now, and then yeah. you know, get to what we can tomorrow. It'll be a little yeah. different, but we'll have fun there as well. Yeah. So sounds good to me. All right, here's <laughs> Saints of L.A. Back with your calls for Mick Mars, Saints of Los Angeles from Motley Crue. Who knows if that'll be the final ever full length album from that band? We'll find out as time goes on. Mick Mars is my guest here in the studio. We've had a great conversation. We're going to go to the phones as promised. Um, but Mick, before we do that, uh, two quick things again. I know I'm forgetting, but this, this stuff comes up a lot. Um, somebody mentioned something to me about a country record, which I don't know much about, a Motley Crue country covers record. Do mm -hmm. you know about that? Can you share? Um, from what I understand, there's uh, uh, some country artists that are going to cover some of the songs, I know Home Sweet Home is one. Carrie Underwood already has already done that once. And uh, I would say she might, she should try it again. But that's just my <laughs> own, that's my own, that, no, 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 that isn't negative. That's my own biased opinion. That she Take should, another swing. <laughs> yeah, she should do it again because she did a great job. Oh, okay. And uh, um, and there's uh, some some other um, bands that I, I, I don't know because I didn't get the list. I didn't get the list of uh, the songs that they're going to do. I'm I looking just, at a press release here. It says summer 2014. Country music tribute to Motley Crue. We had a few callers about this earlier. It's the first I was hearing about it, so I didn't uh -huh. know much about it. And I know a lot of times tribute records come out and bands have absolutely nothing to do with them. Right. But this is this looks like it's a case where it's it's on your you know going through your management. So it sounds like they are, uh, you know, you, you're on board with it to some degree. Uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds like I'm teach telling you about it, Mick. <laughs> uh, I, this is the first I've heard of it. No, I'm just kidding. No, and, um, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure of how this came about. You know, actually in re in real, I don't know. Right. I don't know. It was just. I think it was just a, a kind of one of those throw it out on the table and see what happens, and it's it's. I guess it's stuck. Are you a fan yeah. of country music? Um, I like all music. I'm I don't play country because they. I mean, I don't play a lot of music, but I don't play jazz either. But right. you know, it doesn't mean that I don't like it or anything. I'm just a just a big banging heavy friggin' heavy bash tear up mash up guitar player and we know? love you for that that's exactly <laughs> what you should do and finally before i go to the phones i promise we'll go to the phones right after this you guys so sit tight for one more second i want to ask you about your health um tell me how you're doing these days getting around how you're feeling and for people that don't know exactly what is is wrong with you what info you can shed about what you're dealing with um or share i should say <laughs> The, the first thing I can say is the the, um, the uh, inconvenience, I don't call anything a disease, it's the inconvenience I have is called ankylosing spondylitis. What it does is uh, uh, it's actually a, 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 good Lord, a gene called HLA-B27 that goes in and forms calcium over your bones. And what it does is seizes up your spine, your shoulders, your hips, uh, it starts off mostly in your hips. And then as later on, I was like starting to be bent at like about, you know, 35 or 40. I mean, really bent. I already looked like 80. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the part that sucks the most about it. It hurts constantly. Um, so if any of you guys have it, please stick to NSAIDs. Don't go the quick route. Um, what is that? Is that a, oh, that's Vicodin. Lortab, all the, 
all the crap that doctors want to give you for pain. You're saying don't do that. Don't don't do that. What 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 do you do, Mick? That makes you feel better. Do you have a regimen on the road? No, I just have to endure. <laughs> really? You know? Um, Does I'll, it progressively I'll, I'll, get worse? I'll tell you. Uh, yes, it's all the way up into my brainstem. I can't turn my neck. Uh, my shoulders are pretty much solid. Um, I've had a right right hip replacement. They, I needed a left knee replacement at the same time, but they only gave me one. And uh, it rarely gets into your hands, rarely gets into your feet, but any place else, open territory. <laughs> and it's, it's brutal. Does it move, or when, does it, does, when it gets there, does it stay? It stays. And uh, I, there are... There's a couple ways that you can go with this stuff because it, it uh, seizes, like I said earlier, it seizes your spine up and then after it does that, they call it a bamboo spine. It looks like a piece of bamboo. So that's how my spine is. Um, when I was in Canada, I was hit by a guy that came on stage. Now, I have strong bones, but the ankylosing spondylitis itself is very thin. And it's shattered like an eggshell. So like all this stuff in my back and in my shoulders and stuff, I didn't feel till a couple of days later. And then I felt it again because it's growing back again. Oh, so it's a constant kind of a thing. And it cracks and, and fractures and that stuff, you know, a lot, a lot of times. I imagine you've seen every specialist you can about this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And is there any, you know, maybe stem cells or is there any advancements that can help you you know i i keep uh donating as much money as i get you know not not what i'm paid but you know what i'm saying is like if i sell stuff and i put stuff up like uh uh specifically for as and raising money for them and and this that and the other and i believe that i believe in stem cell very very much um i don't i don't know how it would really work on because I got bone jettering. I don't know how would you know I, I'm like completely ignorant of how stem cells right. work right but I know that they do <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't know I, I they're they're working on it are you, you know? in pain on stage when I'm on stage uh yes but I kind of forget about it because I'm thinking about other things, especially about hitting my head in on Nikki's microphone. <laughs> yeah, that big swinging thing he's got there, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I was saying earlier about um, how, how AS can um, works. And if, if, had I slept flat on my stomach or on my back, I'd have been straight, but I looked like Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, my doctor didn't tell me that at the time. So the way how that did I, you sleep? That, I, that was I, worse. I, I propped. You're not supposed to. You mean sleep prop. like you're sitting up? Yeah, with some pillows behind. And uh, it's it's a good thing that I did that. And I'll tell you why. I wouldn't be able to see my guitar. <laughs> right. When I'm playing on stage, I'd be like state stiff and look like. You know the Frankenstein monster walking, around. and uh, um, so I'm bent. I look older than what I am, older than how I feel. You know, and it's 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 a it's a horrible, ugly thing. Is it hereditary? Do you know? Yes, you it's, it, it's in you your get, family. You get it from your mother. Did she? Did your mom have it? No, no, she has the gene, but she never got it. You know, it didn't develop into AS, but you get it from the your mother. When did you first realize that you had it? Um, uh, maybe in my early teens. Oh, so you've been dealing with this for a long time. Yeah. And it's just progressively gotten worse. Oh, yeah. So yeah. the fact that Motley Crue is ending and that this is a farewell tour, is that somewhat of a relief for you? Because I imagine travel... And doing, you know, I'm looking at this long list of shows for the next mm -hmm. year and a half. I mean, that's got to be rough on you, right? Um, it gets that way, but, you know, it's what I love to do. 
And after Motley Crue's done, I'm not stopping. You're going to do solo shows, your own oh, stuff? Yeah. I'm going to do my own stuff. I'm going to do as much as I can. And I would imagine, though, the flip side of that is it takes, if you were just sitting at home looking at the wall, dealing <laughs> with what you're dealing with, it would be a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. Like you said, being on stage, being in front of people, being in a different city, it's got to take your mind off of it a little oh, yeah. bit. Yeah, definitely. So the last, uh, probably the stage. worst thing you could do is it would be to stop. Yeah, or, fi- or feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> and there, <laughs> I hear lots of stuff like, uh, uh, you know, in different places or Facebook or this, that, and, that. and Mick Mars is so messed up that he, he has to be in a wheelchair now. And then I get like other people tweet me and going like, hey... Mick, my doctor says I'm going to be in a wheelchair by the 24, and I tell him, I go, no, you're not. I go, that's bullshit, man. Whoever's telling you that is full of crap. No, well, for those no. people, you're, you've got to be an inspiration because well, you're you're up there rocking with well, I, dealing with it all these decades. I, I, I hope that I am. Yeah, I would think you because would Because I don't like the idea of some quack telling a guy with AS that is fully capable of doing Anything, or even beyond what I'm doing now. And some quack telling me he's going to be 24 in a wheelchair. That's bullshit. Mm. It makes me mad. I want to go choke the fucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I could see that. Well, you know? you're a testament to that, to those people that are dealing with the same thing as you, that yeah. you can yeah. still and get there, out there. There's, and... there's quite a few, too, that uh, you know write to me quite a bit yeah, I'm sure. on Twitter. All right, before these listeners write me and scream at me that i didn't give them a chance to talk to you because we could do this for a long time i'm going to let the uh the callers finish up the show again uh the website for the motley dates because we got people listening all over america and canada is it just motley.com is that the site steve i thought it was just motley.com but well ticketmaster.com slash motley crew dash tickets live nation.com motleyvip.com motley.com slash tour Pretty much you punch Motley into a computer anywhere, <laughs> and you're going to get something that you need to yeah. know. And you've got Alice Cooper, which is just yeah. awesome to have on these shows. Yes, exactly. I have, I, <laughs> right when we were doing the press conference for this, <laughs> I went up to Alice and I go, Alice, you and I on stage together, people will finally figure it out. Because <laughs> I went up to him and I go, hey, Alice, they ever get called Mick Mars? And he goes, all the time. And I go, I get Alice too. And he goes... <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so maybe if you walk out during Alice's set and jam schools out or something, that's right. People be freaked out. Whoa, man, there's like, some really good stuff. I'm hey, seeing two. How's how's <laughs> how's he over there singing and playing guitar at the same time? <laughs> be funny. I don't know if Alice plays guitar, but you could have no. Him. But if it'd be like I would be, and they think that I would be Alice, and and I don't know. Alice is what a, what a great great person Alice is, and a, he's another guy. You, you got these guys that you look at, and there's some of these bands out there that we all have our feelings about that stayed too long at the party. Mm-hmm. Alice is a guy that he's been doing this forever. He's still as good as he ever was. Oh, yeah. And I said this to Alice. I said, you were smart, because when you were a kid, you made yourself up to look old and decrepit. Mm-hmm. So now, 40 years later, you just use less makeup. Kind of like what I did. <laughs> <laughs> if you start out a certain way, you got nowhere to go. That's what up? right. That's so it's right. perfect. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys all for your patience, and we are now going to go to you. And uh, I don't even know. We're just going to start with the guys who have been waiting like an hour to get on the phone. We'll go to Dallas first. Danny, you're on the air with Mick Mars. Go ahead, Danny. Gentlemen, how are you guys tonight? We're great. great. Thank you. Um, Eddie, real quick, every time I call, I always say Cowboys suck, but unfortunately it's not football season, so I really can't say that. So I will just say Rangers suck. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mick, first off, it's an honor and a privilege to talk to you, sir. Thank you. you. You and your band are the ones who actually got me wanting to play music. I saw Livewire on MTV back in 82, 83, <laughs> and I just went, that's what I got to do. Uh-huh. So thank, thank you for that. Um, you are truly one of my favorite guitar players in the world. You have a swagger about your playing and your solos that's just untouched and nobody can replicate it. Oh, thank you. Eddie, Eddie's already asked my question, so I feel kind of stupid asking the same thing. So I'm just going to go with that. I love you to death. You're my favorite guitar player, and thank you for all the years of inspiration. Hopefully one day I get to meet you and shake your hand at least. So. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. Danny, thank yeah. you for the call. Very cool. 
appreciate you uh, taking the time and waiting to uh, deliver that to Mick. Let's go to Georgia right now and say hello to Vinny. Vinny, you're on with Mick Mars. It's Vinny with a B. That's all right. Oh, I'm sorry, man. They put Vinny on the screen. Go ahead, bud. It's all good. What's up, Mick Dog? What are you doing, son? <laughs> How much, man? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I've been a fan of yours for 30 years, and uh, you've been a soundtrack of my life, and you guys are surely going to be missed by everybody. And uh, just can't believe it's over. Anyways, and I also wanted to comment on the Motley Crue 94 album. That was a very underrated album. I think Nick and uh, Tommy's best work was on that album. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and I wanted to ask, is there going to be a uh, special last date, like in Los Angeles, to send you guys away a couple days? And what can we do to get Nicky to throw in some obscure songs in the set list? And I love you, Nick. Um. Well, I believe that we're, uh, I mean, we haven't got to the point of rehearsing yet, but I, I'm, uh, I know that we're playing for two hours, so hopefully we'll be digging out some of that, the older stuff like Bastard or some kind of stuff like that and putting it out there because I know we used to play them all the time and there's people like want to hear Keep Your Eye on the Money or, you know, kind of things like that and that's like something to really consider and do that instead of the same uh, four songs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, everybody's got their favorites, and you got to do the yeah, hits. Yeah, of, of course, you, gotta, you got to do the hits. It's funny, man. because before you guys did the Las Vegas residency, Nikki sends me a text, and he goes, hey, man, so um, I'm thinking of opening, the, we're thinking of opening the show with Red Hot. What do you think of that? And I said, anything from Shout at the Devil or the first record's good by me, man. That would be mm -hmm. awesome. He goes, and he's busting my balls, of course, because then he responds back, and he goes, Oh, that's too bad, because after Red Hot, we were going to play Theater of Pain start to finish. <laughs> oh. I said, no, you're not, if you don't want to clear the building. I don't think everybody wants to hear every song from that. But uh -huh. but that just goes to show everybody's got a different no. a, a different thing, you know, that yeah. they're into. That's true. Let's go to Memphis. Say hello to Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. How are you? Great. Hey, Mick. Uh wanted to ask if you'd expand a little bit more on your uh, guitar influences, and then before you do, just briefly just couple things i've played guitar forever and i love how you use slide a lot uh -huh. you know you're playing these heavy songs and all of a sudden here comes this crushing you know blues oriented slide solo that fits perfectly with it i think that's very unique thank you and then um also um especially in the earlier records you did a lot of tremolo picking which not that richie invented it but to me a lot of times it sounds real richie blackmore-ish so i wondered if that mm -hmm. was an influence there and then, and then the last thing was with the tune downing the whole stuff when I was a kid, it drove me insane because I was trying to learn you guys' song. <laughs> I realized and that's what it was. And I was like, this is it right. <laughs> so years later, I figured it out. But I, want, I can't think of a band who did that earlier, and I wondered if, if that was a means to an end with your tone or, or some other reason for that and where that came from. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I went to rehearsal one day, and I told the guys that we we are like, you know, only three instruments and a singer. And I go, like, let's drop a, sol a whole step. Make it fuller, make it fatter. And <laughs> the strings were flopping all over the place. And it also was, like you said, hard for people to figure out what we were doing. A lot of bands before that were turning to E-flat. Jimi Hendrix would turn to E-flat. And other bands would. Kiss did for a while. Um, you know, so it's like, you know, kind of doing that kind of thing. And... uh it actually Hendrix threw me off dropping to E flat because I was A four forty then too. So that's that's about all I can tell you. Not man. being a musician, I don't know anything that you just said. <laughs> but I can tell you that I know that most bands when they tune down, it's also to help the singing. Right? Is that accurate? Um, a lot of bands tune down because it helps the singer. It depends on the singer. <laughs> As if you play like uh in uh let's say you drop down to a to a D, like we drop a whole step. So when you're playing in G, right, it's actually F, right? No, it's actually A. No. I'm just listening to you because I don't know F from G from Z anyway, to B. I, I can't. I only <laughs> I only talk about music, Mick. I can't play a note. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Remember that guitar lesson you're going to give me? When I'm, we started I'm, an hour and a half I'm, ago. You I'm, got your work cut out for you. I, oh no, I don't. <laughs> It'll be easy. I'll I'll show you, but. uh yeah, it's uh, um, I don't know something that you know. It's just like 
Made it, made it fatter, made it different. Was Blackmore an influence? That was the other thing he asked. Uh, Blackmore was uh, kind of, uh, he had those real kind of harmonic solos. And uh, I, I like those things, especially the stuff that he did on uh, Highway Star and some of those weird things. And, uh, well, they weren't weird. I liked them. <laughs> but, you know, like stuff like that. You know, so he, yeah, he influenced me to a degree, but uh, I was really more more into the like real, uh, uh, really, I don't know. Tone mattered a lot to me, and and um, playing styles and stuff, and the and the uh, the Blackmores, the the Becks, the uh, uh, Hendrixes, the the uh, people like that really had a strong influence on me. Alvin Lee. Michael Bloomfields, all all these guys. Ricky in Maryland, thanks for waiting. Ricky, you're on with Mick Mars. Hey, Eddie, thanks for taking my call, brother. Sure. Hey, Mick, how you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? Uh, I'm doing just fine. Thank, thanks a lot for uh, taking your time here tonight to talk to us, man. P- really appreciate that. I I just want to say a couple things to you and ask you a question or two. Okay. Just for a second here. Uh, first off, uh, my first concert ever back in '85 mm-hmm. was the Theater of Pain tour. And and I'm real proud to say that uh, Motley Crue was my very first concert. That was awesome. Uh, uh, thanks. And I, I've seen, yeah, man. I, I've seen every one of your concerts since every album. Wow. Um, and and I've got tickets to the one that's coming up here in Maryland. Actually, it's going to be in Virginia, but uh, close enough. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to that uh, seeing you guys. And then uh, I got to say, uh, my uh, girlfriend Peggy wanted me to say this. So I promised I would. She wanted to thank you for all your kick-ass years with Molly Crew. She's a Molly Crew fan, favorite favorite band ever. Wow, that's and, uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, I got to ask you this: Do you still have your red Corvette, your '70s style? You know, I just I sold that thing not too long ago, and I gave all the money to AS. What year was it? Uh, it was a '76, but I had it built up. <laughs> it went zero to sixty under three seconds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Are you still able to drive? No, I can't drive anymore. When was the last time you were able to drive? 15 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it just because it's painful? No, it's like I can't turn my head. So if there's a car coming right that, that, That's a problem. And the only thing I can see is straight. I could drive to, I could drive Indy cars or whatever you want to call those little quarter mile little... Uh, I don't know, when I was a kid, they called them a rail. But well, NASCAR is just a bunch of left turns anyway, so all you got to do is... You, nah, know, you can drive <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> you know what, Mick? I, I don't know when somebody. the last time you've been in a new, new car, but with the advances in cars, you may be able to drive soon because I just had a loaner, and it's got cameras that show you right, left, behind you. I mean, it's like a cockpit in there, so maybe yes. it's going to get to a point where you don't even need to turn your head to drive. Yeah. They yeah. got a car coming out that drives itself. I'll I'll, da- I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> there, there you just go. Put a, just put one of those, those computer it. Yeah. Just put it in the card. <laughs> Chris in Iowa. Go ahead. You're on with Mick Marsh, Chris. Hey, Eddie, thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Sure, man. Hey, Mick, uh, I just, uh, the last caller kind of had the same questions I have, but in the sediments, but just, it's just an honor to talk to you. I've been a fan since, oh, geez, I was 12, 13 years old. Um, my stepdad took me and a couple buddies to see you guys in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in a, in a red uh, AMC Pacer. And it was just, <laughs> wow. Ever ever since then, it's been. I I whenever you guys get around Iowa area, uh, Davenport, uh-huh. uh, Quad Cities area, I always go to see you and just I want to. This is awesome talking to you. Um, I've seen you Motley a bunch of times. And uh-huh. This is really cool. But just a real quick question: Is what's what's your favorite song to play? What on you know when you're on stage? What Motley Crue song do you love to play? Get up there. Um. Probably my my favorite song to uh, play live is Primal Scream. Oh, Mick, we are, I don't know how we haven't done this earlier (laughs) in my 30 years of radio because we are right on the same wavelength. (laughs) Primal Scream is one of my favorite Motley songs. Yeah. It's a great song and it's almost been in the live set since you did it. Yeah. And what's crazy about it, it was a bonus track originally on a hits record. It's not even on a proper record. Nope. But it is a great song. Yeah. And and what you do in that song is so it's got such a groove to it. Yep, that's right. So good. <laughs> that's good what stuff. it's about. That's what music's about to me. Yeah, great one, great one for sure. Mick and I are on this uh, 
Same same wavelength somehow. I never knew. I never knew. This awesome. is great. You never know until you ask. Tara in <laughs> Pennsylvania. Go ahead. You're on with Mick Mars. Hey, what's up, Eddie? Hey. I gotta never say this. What's up, Mick Mars? How are you doing? <laughs> I doing good, good. Um, Eddie kind of went over. I had a question about your house, but uh, thanks for coming out every night and kicking ass. And I, I enjoy every show. We we try to go to every show close to Pennsylvania. So that's all good. Um, hopefully. <laughs> So, uh, um, you know, I'm sorry. I'm so nervous. That's all right. But, uh, Go ahead with your question, Tara. <laughs> um, I kind of went over everything. Like, what do you do on your off time when you're on tour? Um, mostly I write. Um, nice. Or play video games. <laughs> That's nice, huh? <laughs> no. Well, we talked about this, though, um, while the song was playing a few minutes ago, though, mm -hmm. Mick. You were talking about and you reference this a couple times, that one of the greatest things beyond playing the music is that you get paid essentially to see, see the, the world. world. That's right. So do you, when you go around the world, do you get to get out and get around and see? Because I talk to a lot of artists that like, now we sleep, see the hotel, see the stage, mm -hmm. and on to the next. Mm -hmm. um, you also get to drive through the town, and you get to do this. Uh, you know, It's like I want to see that uh, bone church that's just out of Copenhagen. There's a bone church? Yeah, it's all made out of bones and stuff. It's cool. I haven't been there yet. So um, that's on the list. I'm going there. <laughs> but uh, Is yeah, there a Motley I mean, Crue show in Copenhagen, or are you going to book one just to make sure you see the Bone Church? I don't know. I just might go there just for the hell of it and just do it. <laughs> see, that's a perfect thing for Mick Mars to go on vacation. Mick, where'd you go? To the Bone Church. That's right. People would say, of course you did. That's just perfect. <laughs> if you go to Pennsylvania and Philly, there's this thing... My wife made me go to, because she's into creepy stuff, the, the uh, Mutter Museum, it's called. Oh, yeah, I know about that You place. been there? Uh, no, I watch it. Oh. I watch, I watch, I know a lot about it. It's all like the buttons all, that little all kids death stuff. Swallowed. Yes. It's all things that cause death. Yeah, buttons that little babies have swallowed. Crazy. And all sorts of stuff. Yep. Crazy. <laughs> but you've never been there? Nope. But you enjoy getting around and seeing what you can when you're on the road? Well, you know, I get, I get in uh, um, um, on the bus... You know, I get to go through Paris. I get to see all this stuff. I get to go through Italy and see the Colosseum and all these other places and this, that, and the other. Um, some other places that I like to see, but I shouldn't like to see, but I like to see them anyway. But, you know. Um, Just because they're weird, you mean? Yeah, they're weird and they're, they're like kind of sensitive right? as well. So, Nick in Oklahoma, you're on with Mick Mars. Go ahead, Nick. Hey, uh, I was just going to say that Yo, Molly Crew is one of my favorite bands of all time. Thank you. And um, I'm I'm only 14. My dad introduced me to y'all when I'm about seven. Seven? <laughs> yeah. What was good, the first good. Motley Crue song you heard at seven? Um, I wasn't like Bastard was. or anything like that, was it? Huh? It wasn't. I'm just being stupid. It wasn't like Bastard or anything. Your dad at seven didn't play you Bastard, did he? I think you did. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's a good pop right there, if you ask me. <laughs> little extreme yeah. for a boy, but okay. Uh, yeah, but one of you, I've always wanted to meet you, and but I almost had the chance to go to the Tulsa concert and meet you. Uh huh. Uh, but we didn't have, we had enough money for one ticket, and I can't go by myself. But. Yeah. Well, Nick, save up, and if the thank you for the call, and if the Motley Crew, you're 14, if the Motley Crew farewell tour lasts four years, you'll be 18, and you'll be able to go by yourself. Uh -huh. And hopefully you will have saved up money, but by in four years, the tickets could be $300 a pop. You never well, know. Well, dude, you already sound like you're 20, so <laughs> yeah, you does. should just come on in. <laughs> uh, Ricky in St. Louis has been waiting over an hour. Go ahead real quick, Rick. Hey, uh, Nick. First of all, uh, this is an honor to talk to you. Um, I'm about to have like a Wayne's World moment right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, I mean, I'm only 19 years old, but uh, Motley Crue is my favorite band. I heard you guys for the first time when I was 14, and I mean, I have like every single song, demo, everything you guys have like ever recorded. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering, though... Uh, one song that I would love to hear live is uh, City Boy Blues. Do you guys uh, know if you might put that one in the set? You know, I, I'm, I, I'm not real sure, but I'll tell you, when we did that song, we did. We were out on tour with Y&T, 
And I don't, you were Great probably bands. you were probably zero at that time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But but we did play a live at one time. And I, I don't want to say, yes, we're going to play and not, because I'm not that kind of person to say yes and not do something. And Mick has already talked about how much he loves the Theater of Pain record. Yeah. that's from. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> one more quick one, because Gary in Michigan's been waiting over an hour. We're running out of time, Gary, but go ahead real quick. Great. Thanks so much for taking the call. Love, uh, of course, TMS and uh, love the crew. Thanks. I already got my tickets for the show at Joe Lewis in November. But, hey, the story about Kickstart My Heart, I found very interesting with the Montrose connection, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, Mick, you've got to be a fan of the suite because that riff <laughs> sounds awfully familiar. Uh, that song Hellraiser by the suite. Am I right? You know, I'm not familiar with that song, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, put, it could, it could, it could be. List. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look up on my on my iTunes and find it. Maybe it's a song that you did in Vendetta that you didn't even remember that you were covering you know back what? then. Sometimes that crap happens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Gary. All right. I, thanks so much for taking the call. You got it, man. Okay. Thank you for uh, for waiting over an hour for that. And Sweet is a band that hugely. I mean, people have covered their songs, had huge success with. And, uh -huh. Definitely a uh, very influential band, more, more known for the people who have covered their songs maybe uh -huh. than their own songs. But um, anyway, I don't know what, what uh, Riff he was talking about, really. But uh, kickstart Mick, my heart. But yeah. the beginnings, the, the the bad motor scooter thing. I don't know what part in the song he's talking about. That's what I don't either. No. But they came in with three chords, which he might be talking about. Yeah, I'm not sure. And and not to be an asshole, but my. Uh, one of the guys in my band is a big, giant, sweet fan, so I wouldn't be surprised. Who? Is Nikki? <gasps> I didn't say that. Well, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being a sweet fan. I know. <laughs> and Nikki's into a lot of that 70s sort of stuff, yeah. so that would make sense. Yeah. We already we talked about it. He covered a Raspberry song, so. That's right. All right, well, listen, we got to end to the second because this is a live show, and they snap it right back to the second from me uh, here, so we've got to wrap it up um, and time this out as best I can, but just with our final... 90 seconds or so. Um, anything we miss that we imperatively have to tell people? Uh, Steve, anything you want to make sure we get out? While you were out, we touched on the country record. We talked about what Mick's going to do going forward. Of course, the big news, the Motley Tour with Alice Cooper. Ton of dates, more to come. Yes. That caller mentioned before, have you thought about the big shebang last, last show? And I don't know if there's... Nikki told um, me some stuff that I'm not going to say publicly because I don't know if it's supposed to be public, but I know he had an idea. Do you, are you... Do you have any ideas? I, you know, I don't know what he was telling me, but I, you know, I know what I'm thinking too. But what are you thinking? What would you like to have happen? Not saying it's going to happen, but what would you like to do? What would I like to do? Yeah. Um. <laughs> I don't know. Play the whiskey. <laughs> Reunite I would, with I would, Vendetta. I would, you know, I, the Beatles set kind of like that kind of a thing too, and I know a lot of people talk about the Beatles, but they said a lot of like things that did a lot of things that were cool. They uh, played on that uh, Apple record rooftop. Oh, the thing. rooftop, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Something like that. That would be great. Yeah. I'd love that. Well, listen. Just, with, just, just, and get arrested. <laughs> go out and arrested. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, man, it's been an honor, and I appreciate you taking the time, all this time, to come in and hang with me. And please come back and do it again anytime you want. Okay. Um, it's been so much fun, and there's so many other things we could get into and discuss. Again, Mick Mars will be on that metal show this Saturday. We'll be taping that tomorrow in New York City. And you'll see it everywhere on VH1 Classic, 11, 10 Central, this coming Saturday night. So we look forward to doing that. Motley.com for all the information and tour dates to find out where the band is headed. Uh, there's a lot of touring still to come. It's far from over yet, but it's in the final stages so get those tickets a great bill with alice cooper opening up as well follow mick on twitter at mr mick mars you can follow me at eddie trunk and i'll see you guys again next monday another live show starting at six eastern three pacific here on sirius xm 39 trunk nation thanks for listening everybody thanks mick